Hello and welcome to everybody. Uh, welcome to another weekly installment of the USA Hockey Officiating Zoomcast program. Uh, for those who don't know me, I am US, I'm BJ Ringrose, USA Hockey uh, Officiating Program Manager. Um, joining me with, uh, with me for this episode is, I've uh, got a good panelist, uh, highly experienced within our topic, and our topic being, of course, USA Hockey playing roles. Uh, for those of you who pay attention to your rule book covers, you'll notice that the seasons indicated on those covers with the 2020-21 season, we are entering our final season with the current playing rules as they stand, which means we are now entering in our playing rule change process. So this Zoomcast that we put together, this episode was put together with the idea of kicking off that whole rule change process. And that'll be one of the topics that we're going to uh, discuss over the next hour here. Uh, as I said, got three panelists here, uh, highly uh, educated and experienced within the rule, uh, U.S. hockey playing rules and the playing uh, rule change process, starting with uh, Matt Leaf. Matt Leaf uh, from Colorado Springs, where he serves as the director of the USA Hockey Officiating Education Program. Uh, not only that role, but also as the staff liaison to the USA Hockey Playing Rules Committee. And uh, Matt, just uh, a brief kind of uh, rundown. As a staff liaison, what... Uh, just kind of a general rundown of what your duties are within that role. Yeah, thanks, BJ, and, and welcome everyone to tonight's session. Uh, in a nutshell, is, is I kind of sort of coordinate uh, the processing of the rule change proposals that come in, uh, work with the uh, chairman, Mr. Hall, on the logistics as it relates to any meetings that come up, and uh, and work with uh, our, uh, our our staff uh, production specialist, Dana Osik, as it relates to the editing and and formatting of the rule book and those types of things. So, um, and uh, I guess in essence, uh, I'm kind of sort of the uh, staff person that's, uh, that's assisting in the entire process and, and hopefully making sure that things run smoothly. Thanks, Matt. Moving on from Matt, uh, we go to John Koralczyk, who's from the Morgantown, West Virginia area, Gold Mountaineers. Uh, he's a private visitor, a personal business owner, an operator out there. That's his uh, real uh, normal job, but he serves USA Hockey in many capacities as a volunteer. Uh, always remembering that USA Hockey is first and foremost a volunteer-driven organization. Uh, of those positions that he holds, he is the district director for the USA Hockey Mid-American District, uh, but he also serves on the USA Hockey Playing Rules Committee, uh, and he served uh, for six years now. John, being on the Playing Rules Committee, what, uh, what, do you, what do you enjoy about serving in that capacity on the Playing Rules Committee? Well, we have a, we have a very diverse committee, so I enjoy uh, the company of the, of the committee members. Uh, the knowledge that they bring, years and years and years of experience from multiple different areas, multiple different disciplines, including coaching and uh, officiating, and uh, they're, 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 the information they bring is just wonderful so i enjoy it as a volunteer excellent thanks john uh to our last panelist uh we go to bill hall bill hall is uh, originally from the potsdam new york area uh retired police officer by trade and then uh again serving as one of our key volunteers in usa hockey um most notably as the secretary of the usa hockey executive committee which is our uh highest serving, uh, highest ranking committee, aside from the board of directors, which is our ultimate governing body. Uh, but he also serves as the chairman of the USA Hockey Playing Rules Committee, both uh, positions he's held for 16 years. So he's worked his way through the ranks as uh, a uh, affiliate volunteer and district volunteer and now serves on a national level. And uh, welcome, Bill. And same question as John. Bill, what uh, do you enjoy uh, as, as your role serving on the USA Hockey Playing Rules Committee? Well, just like John, I enjoy the diversity of the committee. A lot of the members uh, uh, I was able to influ influence the appointment. They bring a great deal of background, hockey background to the committee. I also enjoy challenging uh, the membership with various initiatives. Uh, this committee done a lot of important work, which I'll get into in my discussion points, but um, I really enjoy the diversity. It's a lot of good discussions that go on in the room. And we try, and we do accomplish a lot in our in a timely manner when we do meet. So I enjoy that. Excellent, thanks, Bill. Uh, just to cover a few logistics to our participants who may be watching and uh, hopefully watching us about the same time they got an eye on uh, one of the two of the NHL games that may happen to be playing right now. We'll do our best to compete with the excitement that's going on because I just got word that one of the games has gone into quadruple overtime. Um, 
That being said, if you have joined us through uh, Zoom and the Zoom platform, uh, and actually in our participant room, you have the ability to ask our uh, esteemed panel a question, uh, any question uh, relating to the USA Hockey Playing Rules, uh, the USA Hockey Playing Rules Committee, or the rule change process, which uh, we will get into and explain uh, pretty thoroughly. Uh, but feel free to submit those questions, and uh, we'll do our best to answer as many, if not all, of those questions as you submit them. If you've chosen to join us on the YouTube channel, uh, we're broadcasting live on YouTube right now. Unfortunately, uh, you do not have the ability to ask questions on the YouTube channel. Uh, and then any questions, anything that you submit in the topics on the YouTube channel will not be addressed as well. Uh, the only comments and questions we will be addressing are the ones submitted here on the Zoom platform. With that said, we will dive into the topics. And uh, we're gonna start it off with a quick poll and again, this poll can only be answered by those on the Zoom platform. Those watching on YouTube do not, uh, unfortunately, do not have the ability to participate in the, uh, the participant poll. Uh, two questions. First question, have you ever submitted a USA Hockey playing rule change proposal? And it's a simple yes or no question. Second question, true or false, the USA Hockey Playing Rules Committee votes to approve or decline the playing rule changes. So all those playing rule change proposals that get submitted and are reviewed by USA Hockey, who ultimately votes in, uh, on whether to approve or accept a uh, playing rule change proposal versus declining a uh, rule change proposal. And we're at about 78%, so we'll hold the polls open for another couple seconds here and then uh, we'll close it out. Okay, pencils down and share the results with everyone. Overwhelming majority, 90, looks like 92% overall have not changed a, uh, submitted a rule change proposal. Um, when uh, Matt covers this topic, you'll actually have at least the education and knowledge of how that process works and uh, should you be so inclined to uh, come up with something to uh, uh, make our game better and safer and uh, more exciting for everyone and positive for everyone. Uh, you'll have the knowledge now on how that process works. Uh, to the whether the playing rules committee ultimately votes to whether accept or decline the uh, rule change proposals. Uh, looks like most of you believe that that is true. Uh, and then about two thirds of you and then the other third of you think that's a false statement. And uh, Matt will actually clarify whether that's actually a true face statement or a false statement. And on that note, we'll move into our first topic, which is the rule change proposal process review and then the process itself. So go ahead, Matt. Okay, thanks, BJ. Uh, yeah, I just wanna take a few minutes as, as most of you are probably aware, USA Hockey is currently in a four year rule cycle. So that means when we go through the plain rule change process, um, that will go into the book and, and that book covers four seasons uh, with uh, um, the current book going into the 2021 season being the last season that uh, is in that four year cycle. So that means that we're actually in the process of starting the rule change process right now uh, for adoption uh, at the uh, 2021 USA Hockey Annual Congress. Um, and then from there, uh, those rules that are adopted or those changes that are adopted will go into effect for the 2021-22 season through the 2024-25 seasons. So for the next uh, next four seasons. So part of this process is, is if you've looked at usahockey.com and specifically on the officials page, um, but we'll also be running some stuff here in the next uh, coming weeks on the main page as well. But on the officials page, we've, uh, we've established a, a dedicated page to the plain rule change process. And it outlines uh, what the process is, what the timeline is. There is a uh, plain rule change proposal form that can be downloaded and, and utilized for submission. Uh, we'll also probably in the next week or two uh, have an electronic form that'll be up there as well. But essentially what happens is any member of USA Hockey is welcome to submit a rule change proposal. Uh, when they do so, uh, they do so on a specific form where they outline what the current rule states, what the current rule plain rule is, uh, and they can copy and paste that from the, uh, um, from the PDF version or from the electronic version of the rule book. Uh, and then they have the next section is they, they take what that current language is and they incorporate what their proposed changes are. 
if there's going to be portions of that rule or language that they want to have deleted, um, they'll, they'll show that as being stricken or strike through. Um, if there's some new language that uh, is being added to that particular, particular rule, uh, they'll maybe highlight it in bold or, or uh, with italics or, or something like that, that makes it pretty clear in terms of what their intention is. They're also asked to provide their name, what their, um, what their role is within USA Hockey, whether it's a player, whether it's a coach, volunteer, or an official, uh, and then also provide rationale for as to why they're suggesting that particular rule change. Um, and uh, once they've done that, and, and they can either email that to me or if it's on the electronic uh, uh, form, it goes into a uh, specific email uh, folder that I receive. Uh, what I will do is I will take that, uh, I'll clean up any language or any changes to make sure that it is consistent with the, uh, um, the way that the rule book is generally laid out in terms of a format and consistency in some of the terminology that we may use. Um, I will uh, basically uh, distinguish them as to whether it is a uh, <clears throat> rule that is specific to the junior rule book, because we do have the two rule books that USA Hockey sanctioned. We have the youth and adult rule book, and we also have one that is specific to junior hockey. So we're actually going through two different processes here. So I'll identify which rule book, and it, it may go into both, or it may be proposed for both, or maybe propose just specifically to one or the other. Uh, and then also identify whether it is a significant or considered to be a major rule change that actually is a change in the plain rule spirit and the intent, or whether that proposal is just a housekeeping proposal, meaning that uh, it may be a uh, um, proper, uh, proper grammar, uh, maybe a spelling typo uh, or something of that nature that really does not change the spirit and the intent or the concept of the rule, uh, but it does uh, clean it up and, and uh, correct the mistake that, that may be in the rule book in the first place. So I process all those and send those out to the plain rules committee and the deadline for submission is November 1st and that is outlined in our uh, USA Hockey bylaws. So all these are received prior to November 1st or on November 1st. I'll process everything. I'll put it in a nice, neat little format where every rule change proposal gets a number um, well, along with uh, the current language, the proposed changes, uh, the rationale, and who it was submitted by. Uh, and forward that on to the Plain Rules Committee sometime in early November for their review. And we will actually do a plain, uh, our first meeting of the Plain Rules Committee sometime in, in mid-November mid uh, where we will go through and thoroughly discuss uh, and consider each of the proposals. And generally, uh, over the past several uh, years or the, the, the 26 years that I've been involved, we get somewhere between 200 and 250 different plain rule change proposals. Uh, so each one of those will be vetted uh, very carefully by the plain rules committee. And uh, it's a very passionate group. In some cases, we have some very, uh, uh, detailed and, and very passionate and, and uh, intense discussions. Uh, some other ones uh, maybe go a little bit quicker uh, along the way, but the bottom line is that each and every one of those proposals gets full consideration by the Plain Rules Committee in our November meeting. At that time, we'll also make a preliminary recommendation as to whether it, it's approved, whether we recommend for approval, whether we recommend for defeat, uh, or whether we simply refer that to one of the various councils, sections, or committees that make up USA Hockey structure, whether it be youth council, if it's something that is, is relevant to the adult council, uh, we'll send it to adults. Uh, if it's a safety issue, we may send it to the Safety and Protective Equipment Committee and, and generally uh, refer to them to, to start generating their feedback and give them an opportunity to discuss. In, in December 1st, uh, we'll also post on usahockey.com all of the various rule change proposals in their package, along with the uh, initial recommendation by the Plain Rules Committee. And that is the avenue to uh, get the information out to our membership for them to review, for them to be able to share with uh, any their feedback with any committee members that they may know, or their board of directors or affiliate personnel or, or district referee chiefs, whatever it may be. 
Uh, the Plain Rules Committee will again uh, review and do a quick cursory review during the winter meeting in January. And we'll start soliciting feedback from the various councils and committees uh, on each of the proposals and specifically those proposals that are referred to each one of their respective committees. Um, and uh, we'll continue to um, update um, the board of directors at that time in January may offer amendments if there's some language that they want to change a little bit to some of the proposals, that is their opportunity to fine tune and, uh, and offer amendments to the proposal. And then ultimately, uh, we will post once again, any amended proposals uh, from uh, the winter meeting uh, at the end of January, early February on usahockey.com. Uh, in June, at, uh, uh, at the annual Congress, USA Hockey Annual Congress, the Plain Rules Committee will meet once more time, and we will go through each one of the, uh, the submitted proposals one more time. Uh, we will take the feedback that we received from the various councils and the sections and the committees, the various entities within USA Hockey. We will take that into consideration. We will discuss um, each proposal and, and make a final recommendation that will go to the board of directors. The ultimate body that decides and whether uh, makes the determination of whether a proposal is, accept, is approved and incorporated into the plain rules or is defeated and, and you know, gets put off to the side is our USA Hockey Board of Directors. So during the board of directors meeting, our chairman Bill Hall will present uh, generally in packages uh, for those who are those proposals that uh, are recommended for approval uh, and uh, those proposals that are recommended for defeat. So you know, they're not necessarily voting on all 250 proposals, but if there's uh, 175 that are recommended for defeat um, that are pretty clear cut that everyone within the organization, all the various council sections and committees um, are in favor of defeating, they'll vote those 175 as a package. There'll also generally be about a handful of rule change proposals that really generate some more discussion or need to generate some more discussion amongst the board of directors. So there'll be a package of those that are approved that, uh, that everyone is in agreement uh, and uh, those will get approved as a package. And then uh, there'll be the five or six or seven, however it may be. Um, and the board of directors, each director has, a, has an opportunity to pull any one of those proposals out uh, for special consideration. Um, and there'll, there'll be some additional discussion on the floor of the board of directors before they make a final vote on that individual rule change proposal. So it is a very comprehensive process uh, with, uh, with thorough vetting by uh, not only the plain rules committee who does a lot of the dirty work in terms of preparing, um, processing, and putting together rationale for, rationale uh, possibly for against, to be able to share that with the, the other entities within USA Hockey. And uh, they all have their opportunity to provide some feedback and provide some guidance in terms of um, how they want the board of directors to ultimately go. So that's the process. Once the board of directors get that finalized and, and they have uh, uh, approved the, the proposals that will be uh, incorporated into the next rule book, uh, that's generally going to happen the second weekend in June, so June 10th, 11th, somewhere in there. Um, that's when we get extremely busy with uh, our production uh, specialists to uh, edit um, the updated rule book, um, the format, uh, make sure that all the proposals that, uh, that were adopted are properly incorporated into the new rule book. And uh, that's done within a couple of weeks and, and sent off to the publisher, uh, hopefully no later than July 1st. So we have uh, the finished uh, product and the, the published rule books available to distribute to the officiating community uh, sometime around on August 1st. So that in essence is the uh, process that takes place. Uh, the the key, uh, key things for you uh, to know right now is, is that we're currently accepting plain rule change proposals um, as we speak right now. Uh, I've already gotten my first uh, uh, first handful that have come in over the course of the last couple of days, uh, and that the deadline for proposals uh, is November 1st. Uh, so anything uh, submitted prior to or on November 1st gets consideration. Um, anything after November 1st would uh, 
require 100% of board approval and, and that just doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't happen uh, very often. And then finally, uh, stay tuned to usahockey.com uh, throughout this process over the course of the next uh, uh, eight to 10 months as, uh, up, as updates uh, to the to proposals, uh, recommendations from the various councils and committees and those types of things will all be posted on uh, usahockey.com and will be available to our general membership through that, uh, through that resource. Excellent, thanks, Matt. Uh, just some follow-up questions to that presentation. Uh, we, not too, too long ago, changed from a two-year two rule, two rule change cycle to a four-year rule change cycle. What was the kind of the deciding factor of moving from two years to four years? Yeah, there, there are a few things that were under consideration, but uh, a couple things. And first and foremost, um, I think uh, the committee felt fairly strongly and, and the board of directors ultimately agreed that uh, when we, we make a rule change, uh, and especially if it's a major or a significant rule change, uh, two years is not long enough to be able to really determine uh, what the impact or what the success of that particular change is to be able to monitor um, how, that, the, how that works. And when we were stuck in the two-year cycle, uh, quite frankly, we got to the point where we were, there were certain rules that we were discussing every two years and you know, kind of sort of banging our heads against the wall, uh, going back and forth and, and those types of things without really giving the opportunity for that change or that proposal to, uh, to, to impact the game and, and to be able to monitor what that impact was. Um, it's also consistent with the International Ice Hockey Federation. Obviously, uh, we're involved in the World Championships and the Olympic Games and those types of things. The IHF is on a four-year cycle. Uh, it seems to have worked uh, extremely well for them. And uh, that is where, uh, I guess, prior to the 2013 season, 2013-14 uh, season, um, USA Hockey made that jump to, to, to go to that four-year cycle as well. Thanks, Matt. Uh, another quick question is, not only do we have the, uh, the USA Hockey playing rules, the two rule books, the, the junior rule book and the youth rule book, um, at the same time, we also have the case book. The majority of the participants on this uh, Zoomcast are presumably officials. Um, what is the op updating process, the changing process to the case book, case book questions? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, there is a subcommittee uh, that is formed out of the Plain Rules Committee that is chaired by our National Referee in Chief, Dave Labuda. Um, and they serve as the uh, Plain Rules Interpretation Subcommittee. Uh, so as the rule change process takes place, they will take any, uh, any proposal and they will, this group of, of five individuals, and it's, it's Dave Labuda, uh, Mark Wilkins, who was a former Mid-Am District Referee in Chief, an NCAA official, uh, Dennis LaRue, uh, a former National Hockey League referee and, and Stanley Cup finalist in four Olympic games, um, Scott Zelkin, and, uh, and myself as a staff liaison, and then Jack Witt from the coaches section make up this subcommittee. So they, they will also uh, review the proposals as they come in and as they go through this process, and they will um, double check and, and review those proposals and cross-reference them to the current situations that are in the uh, Plain Rules Casebook and the Interpretations Handbook. Uh, so they'll cross-reference and make any changes that are needed based on the proposals that are adopted. Uh, they'll also review any change, rule change proposal that gets adopted for uh, consideration of new interpretations that may be included um, or will monitor situations or interpretations that may come in throughout that four year cycle uh, to also make sure that they incorporate in that next printing of the uh, rule book case book combination. Great, thanks Matt. Uh, from there, we're going to move on to our next topic. Uh, I just want to remind everyone, feel free to submit your questions using the Q&A feature on the Zoom platform. Uh, for those who may be submitting in comments, we may see it, we may not, but we're definitely paying close attention to the Q&A feature in Zoom uh, for your questions. Moving on, uh, we're going to do another quick poll that will kind of set the stage for our next uh, topic. Again, uh, if you can only answer these questions on the Zoom platform, if you're watching us through YouTube, you cannot participate in the poll. 
Uh, question number one, how many USA Hockey representatives make up the USA Hockey Playing Rules Committee? And the op answer options being less than five, five to nine, 10 to 15, or greater than 15. Second question, how many USA Hockey national staff employees serve on the USA Hockey Playing Rules Committee? So national staff employees working out of the national office in Colorado Springs versus uh, our key volunteers out there in the field representing the various districts and affiliates and so forth. Answers are rolling in. And I'll leave it open for about another five seconds or so. Okay, our polling districts are closed. First question, how many USA Hockey representatives make up the USA Hockey Playing Rules Committee? Uh, about half of you said five to nine. Uh, second greatest uh, or most common popular answer was uh, 10 to 15. And then uh, the second question, how many USA Hockey National Staff employees serve on the USA Hockey Playing Rules Committee? And uh, most of you, or the most popular answer was three. A couple of people said one or two. But uh, to answer those questions, we will uh, move on to John, uh, John Karolczyk. Thank you, BJ. Um, well, first of all, our committee actually has 16 members on it and a staff li li liaison who's uh, Matt Leaf. So to answer your questions, um, we, we start off with a committee of, we have a, at least 16 members and our members made, are made up of, of a board of directors like myself. Um, there's also a, a great diversity of the, of the hockey community. We, we have everything from, the, from uh, uh, NHL, past NHL referees. Uh, we have a representative from the NCAA on our committee. Uh, we have a representative in MAT, which is on our international uh, hockey um, uh, rules committee. Um, and we also have um, members from, from the Federation. We have referee in chief from, from, a, from, a, from our districts. We have coaches in chiefs. We have, so we have a very diverse and very knowledgeable rec, uh, uh, committee. Um, also on that committee, I shouldn't, I, I can't forget, uh, um, we also have usually development guys on our committee. And uh, see, right now we've got, help me out here, Matt. We've got um, Roush. Kenny Roush. Kenny Roush on, yep. Yeah. So Kenny Roush is sitting on our committee now from, uh, from the development side. Um, appointments for these committees, um, as a director, uh, each year we have we fill out a survey to uh, uh, give an idea of what committees we'd like to sit on what what interest we have and, and such and uh, once those are submitted to the national office then they're re then they're reviewed by the, the uh, committee's chairs and uh, then as appointments we get notified uh, via email that we've, we've been uh, selected for these committees uh, so as volunteers, we, we uh, serve on multiple different committees and I've served on junior council, I've served on player safety and, and now I'm very proud to play, uh, be on player uh, playing rules committee. Um, we also have usually have a few subcommittees going on. We've had uh, official retention. Uh, so we, we've had a committee look at officials and how we can retain those and the different variety of, of things we can do to implement those. Uh, we've we've uh, also um, looked at parent behavior as part of that. Um, and also the, the last year we, we've had the player safety directive that was going, that was uh, being handled by multiple different committees. And uh, part of our committee was, was also addressing that with, with youth, youth council and the safety committee. And uh, as Matt mentioned before, we also have an interpretation subcommittee that's headed by Dave Labuda and uh, that addresses those case situations and interpretations. Um, so that makes the dynamic of our committee. I hope that answers the questions that are out there. I think we had a few more questions come in as, as I was speaking. 
Yeah, I'm um, just thinking of one right here or noticing one right here within the Q&A feature. Um, you can maybe deviate a little bit. Someone asked uh, specifically about the board of directors who is uh, the ultimate uh, voting body on playing rule change proposals. You as a director, the district director for the mid -Am district uh, serve on that uh, the board of directors. What's uh, just kind of paint a picture of what the uh, makeup of that group is. Yeah, there's uh, each district has uh, usually has four directors on the, on that, uh, on the, on the mid or on the, uh, the USA Hockey Board of Directors. There's also athlete directors that are on that board. And uh, usually the total voting, usually somewhere around 70 members that uh, as when, once you, and then each, each um, council has their vice president as a, as a voting member. So to kind of paint the picture, it's, it's representation from all different parts of USA Hockey. It's, it's essentially playing, not only the playing rules committee, the districts, uh, the women's section, the referees section, the coaching uh, coaches section, uh, adult council, all different committees and councils and sections have representation there. So it's everyone kind of has their say, has their, their, their part of the process and their, rep their uh, membership, overall membership represented within that board of directors when it comes down to a vote on uh, be it a rule change proposal or a, uh, even a legislative proposal, the rules that ultimately govern USA hockey itself as opposed to the, uh, the game itself. So. Um, Yes, our, our board of directors are, is very large, but it's very diverse. Uh, we, we've got a lot of experience from throughout the community, throughout the nation. No question. Absolutely no question. Thank you, John. Um, moving on to our next topic. And again, I'm going to launch another quick poll here. And this is poll number three. Uh, question number one on the poll. What philosophies are used when considering a playing rule change? Select all that applies. So this, unlike the other questions, this is not a, uh, you can only select one answer. You can actually select as many uh, as you think apply uh, when the playing rule, uh, playing rule committee ultimately uh, considers a playing rule change. Second question, agree or disagree, the NHL influences the playing rules uh, used at the grassroots level. So. Whether you agree or disagree, the, uh, the NHL has a lot of influence over uh, our playing rules at the grassroots level of USA Hockey. And the answer's rolling in. Looks like about half of you have answered so far. Go about another five to 10 seconds. Okay, pencils down, and we'll share those results with you. Uh, what philosophies are used when considering a playing role change? By far the most popular answer is participant safety, which is there's no question that that's definitely a key factor that our uh, playing roles committee and all of our various sections and committees take into consideration when deciding whether they want to uh, change a playing role or not. Uh, some of the other ones, player development, uh, a few of you selected that, fairness and equal advantage. I, I, would have thought it would be a little bit more than 18%. Uh, we would uh, always want to think that our, our playing rules are fair and, and uh, equal to both times, both sides. But uh, I am pretty encouraged to see that uh, none of you actually selected player advancement. And there is a distinction between player development versus player advancement. Player advancement being, how do we get guys to college hockey? How do we get guys to the pro? You know, that mentality of we got to get our players uh, set up for success to move on to uh, professional careers and things like that versus player development. Um, and uh, promoting uh, development, best skills, and ultimately just make our game better. And hopefully through that player development, keep them around and build that, uh, foster that lifelong relationship with the game of ice hockey and USA hockey itself. Uh, agree or disagree, uh, the NHL influences the playing rules used at the grassroots level. Uh, the most popular was somewhat agree. Um, and it was kind of right across the board as far as uh, strongly agree or uh, strongly disagree or somewhat disagree, but most of you said somewhat agree. On that note, we are going to pass the baton on to Bill Hall, who is going to talk a little bit about the philosophies that, the, uh, that drive the USA Hockey Playing Rules in itself. Go ahead and take it away, Bill. Uh, thank you, BJ, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and spend some time with you and, uh, and share some of uh, what I've developed uh, regarding the philosophy 
of uh, rules writing and developing during my tenure as the chairman of the Playing Rules Committee. First, I'd like to take a bit of a diversion and say hi to Butch Martin. Thanks for your note, Butchie. I'm missing my trip uh, to Northern New York this summer. Um, as you know, I get back there every summer, so please say hello to Ernie for me, and uh, I'll leave that as my personal comment of the night. So, uh, but it's always good to see a, a familiar, or at least know a familiar faces out there watching. Uh, as mentioned in my intro, I've been the chair of this Playing Rules Committee for 16 years. Um, and it's always been my advocacy um, to push uh, to the forefront, fair play and respect. Uh, Matt will definitely recall my first uh, efforts when uh, uh, changes that I directly made in this preface of the playing rules book was to, do, to address fair play and respect. Uh, I, to that end, uh, I've, I've made sure that the playing rules committee has been actively involved in a lot of the controversial playing rules uh, or uh, other um, related uh, behavioral things that the uh, USA Hockey addresses, uh, such as the zero tolerance policy, which was a work product of a subcommittee of, of play, uh, playing rules committee members, you know, just adopted at this most recent annual Congress and at the previous annual Congress in 2019, when the uh, Board of Directors uh, adopted the Declaration of Player Safety, Fair Play and Respect, a large contingent of the Playing Rules Committee were part and parcel of the development of that initiative. The purpose, the focus of the Playing Rules Committee, when we look at all these playing rules proposals that we get, is to take in fair play and respect to provide for an adequate set of rules that create a climate of safety and also provide that no one competitor enjoys an unfair advantage over someone else on the ice. And that's really the two basic, what I uh, hope to be the two, two basic premise that each of my playing rules committee members will look into a proposal and make their decision based on that. With regard to a couple of the, uh, the survey questions, uh, uh, I'd like to address the NHL thing first. Uh, I have a couple of, uh, uh, the NHL really involved with truly elite players. Uh, it's an entertainment uh, a factor. Uh, uh, their rules are directed at, uh, at uh, maintaining that the game is, is, is uh, contested fairly, also provides an entertainment factor, and they also are concerned with the length of time, even though the night uh, Columbus and Tampa Bay are not to consider or considering that length of time thing. I don't know if the game is still going on. I shut it off at the start of this uh, discussion, so it was going into the fourth overtime. Uh, I don't know if it's ended yet or not. But the uh, also, player advancement is a, is a part of specialty leagues, the, the USHL, the North American Hockey League, our, junior, our uh, Tier 1 and Tier 2 Junior Leagues, as well as the NCAA uh, Division 1, Division 3 programs uh, are concerned with player advancement. Uh, and uh, it was rightfully, rightfully reflected in the uh, survey results. Um, I have a, I, I'm under the uh, uh, opinion that uh, governing bodies will make the rules that best fit the uh, level of play uh, of their organizations. And one of the, uh, um, the uh, things that USA Hockey has to face is that we go from cradle to grave. So we have players at six years old and we have players into their 70s, not many, but we have a few. And so our playing rules have to uh, pretty much address uh, a, a very wide uh, age range of players and a very wide uh, range of uh, playing abilities. So, uh, the, uh, and and I, to reflect on that, uh, and recently it's now in its 11th year is the American Development Model. 
which you may not think the playing rules are concerned too much with, but we are, because the American development model provides uh, for uh, hockey for life, uh, provides for a, a basis for everyone participating in ice hockey to, uh, to lead a physically active uh, lifestyle. And uh, uh, we like our referees to be prepared to uh, have a, a set of rules to uh, fairly enforce and to provide for that uh, very active and productive lifestyle. Well, that's the philosophy that I carry to the playing rules committee members. Uh, I, I'm a, I, uh, Matt mentioned that we, uh, we have, uh, uh, we, we conduct these meetings. Uh, I, I, I likened it from the very beginning to uh, being the uh, conductor on a, uh, on a train. And the train leaves the station at a designated time and it arrives at a designated time. And uh, we, we, for the most part, on all of our Playing Rules Committee, member, uh, committee meetings have departed on time and, uh, and arrived on time. So I don't drag things out. We, uh, we do give fair consideration to all the proposals um, that are that come in. Matt does a great job of uh, uh, collating them and uh, getting the package out to the committee members and, uh, and uh, we, uh, we address them all. They, uh, that about covers my notes. Uh, they, um, did I miss anything, BJ? I don't think so, but uh, he definitely addressed the uh, the NHL factor and uh, how much the NHL may or may not influence our rules. But we do take other rule books into uh, consideration. We consult with other governing bodies, correct? Yes, we do. Uh, we uh, uh, Matt does a good job of providing everybody with a uh, a comparison chart of uh, the what exists, uh, the differences or the similarities that exists between USA Hockey, uh, the high school federation, and the uh, NCAA. In addition to that, he also provides the committee members updated uh, uh, rules changes or interpretations that have been offered by the IIHF. So we, uh, the committee members are kept, uh, kept in tune with, uh, with what's going on in, by other national, by other governing bodies in hockey. We don't, Spent a lot of time with the NHL for the reasons I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's elite players um, and they uh, certainly their rules are, a lot of their rules are directed at length of uh, length of the game. So with that mindset in mind, I, every once in a while, inevitably, I'll be out at a camp or a seminar or something like that. And someone asks me the question, you know, what, and this, this could be a question for all of you, in fact. Um, you know, is USA Hockey or is, is there any initiative within USA Hockey to try to, amongst the other governing bodies as well, is there any kind of movement of trying to work together to more, to a more common set, you know, a one set of rule book? I don't, I don't think we'll ever get to one rule book for all levels, but uh, is there any initiative or any uh, uh, work being done amongst the different governing bodies to try to work towards more common playing rules? Matt, I'll, I'm going to defer to you on that one. Okay, thanks, Bill, and thanks, BJ. And that's a great, that is a really good question. And um, I would say that the answer to that is yes. Um, we do try to work with the other governing bodies and specifically the NCAA and the National Federation of High Schools because they're the other two uh, um, US-based um, non-professional or amateur, so to speak, um, governing bodies. And, and we do try to work with them to the best that we can. Uh, and uh, there has been in the past, uh, what we call a, a rule summit, where we brought in the leaders from each one of those organizations over the course of a weekend or a day, a full day, and, and go through what are the changes are and, and see where exactly we can find some common ground. We haven't done that uh, recently. It's been about, uh, uh, I think, uh, 12 years or so since the last time that we've done that. Uh, it may be something that uh, that in the coming years, uh, obviously not in time for this next rule change process, but maybe the next cycle uh, kind of sort of plan to, to do something like that again. But we are in constant communication. Uh, we do have representatives uh, from the uh, NCAA um, 
that uh, commissioners of leagues and, and members of their playing rules committee. We've also had representation from the National Federation of High Schools on our, on our own playing rules committee. So we get input from them. Uh, we, we are able to identify where the differences lie. And if we can try to find some common ground, we do that. Uh, however, we also have to recognize, as Bill pointed out, uh, we're serving considerably different memberships. Um, the high school is, is an educational-based uh, forum uh, that uh, is dealing with specifically, for the most part, uh, 15, 16, 17, 18-year-old uh, young men and women. Uh, the NCAA is college-aged, obviously, and, and they're geared a little bit differently. And as Bill pointed out, we're dealing with a community that is, uh, as he, you know, he said, cradle to grave from, from five, six years old up to 70, 80, uh, the hockey for life and, and the varying skill levels and everything else. So um, as you indicated, BJ, we're probably never going to get to the point where there's one set of rule book or one set of rules, uh, but there are some efforts to uh, try to find common ground. And, and there's been some situations where they've adopted, very much adopted some of the things that USA Hockey has done. Um, on their side as, as well, at, at both the NCAA and the N National Federation levels. So it is an ongoing process and something that we'll continue, uh, continue to pursue. Thanks, Matt. And uh, someone actually mentioned it in the chat as well. Uh, do we uh, talk at all with Hockey Canada as well, our uh, neighbors to the north? Uh, a little bit. Not, not quite as much, uh, but uh, I do have communication on a regular basis with my counterpart. Uh, we both serve on the IHF uh, officiating committee together, uh, Todd Anderson, and uh, th there is some communication going on, but um, the reality is, is, is they're a little bit hesitant to do anything that USA Hockey wants to do. And uh, at the same time, uh, we feel that we're definitely heading in some areas in the right direction and feel strongly about our development program and what we're doing. So um, it's, it's not a, uh, not a not necessarily the same intensity as the rival we may bring on the ice, but I think organizationally there um, there is going to be a little bit of a a, a rivalry that's involved that uh, you know that makes us uh, not necessarily just follow, but certainly consider some of the changes or some of the things that they may do. Great, thanks, Matt. Uh, another question submitted: When the rule change proposals are submitted. Is it required that your name be included? In other words, what are the, uh, the demographics? What's the information in addition to the, uh, the proposal itself? What you want changed within the rule? What else do we look for as far as a uh, proposal being submitted? We, we generally want the official or the, the individual's name. Uh, so if we do have any questions or if we want some clarification, we have a way to reach out back to them and what their role is. Because that, that maybe helps us understand what their rationale uh, for the proposal may be a little bit better. Uh, if we know if it's coming from a player or if it's coming from a coach uh, or a volunteer or an official, um, that gives us a little bit of an understanding in terms of where they may be coming from. So the proposals that are submitted, uh, we, do, uh, we do ask that they submit their name and what their role is. Um, that will be shared with the Plain Rules Committee in the initial review process. Um, and that's done so the Plain Rules Committee has a general understanding of, uh, of where it's coming from and what, uh, uh, where the, the rationale may be coming from and also allows the Plain Rules Committee to reach out to them if they do have some additional questions. Um, but once the Plain Rules Committee makes that initial recommendation, um, the submitter uh, basically no longer appears on that proposal and the rationale will then become whatever the plain rules committee's discussion was and rationale for either recommendation for approval or defeat at that time. Thanks, Matt. Uh, just one little bit of housekeeping. A couple of you pointed out that only one possible answer could be selected with that uh, rule change philosophies question on the poll. That's, uh, that's on me. I'll be the first to uh, admit my mistakes, ask any coach within this town. Um, but uh, that's on me. I thought I set that up for multiple answers. So just to clarify that. Uh, Matt, I think you uh, addressed it in your presentation, but someone did follow up and ask about the rule change proposal process. Will there be an e-process or do we have to uh, use the, uh, the form? No, there, there will be an e-process probably that will be posted on the website on that page sometime in the next couple of weeks. Um, our, uh, 
our IT person that has developed that and, and coordinated that effort in the past is, is currently off. Uh, so he gets back uh, next week, and, and I know that it's on his uh, list of things to do. So we should have uh, an electronic version of that form to make it a little bit easier um, for the uh, submitter uh, probably sometime in the next two weeks. That being said, of course, attention to detail when submitting those rule change proposals is uh, really kind of critical. Um, if I can say, I probably submitted myself maybe about a dozen rule change proposals with our last cycle four years ago. And uh, just anything that can be done to make it very, very clear with what's specifically within a playing rule that you want to change. And it can be as simple as a word sometimes. Missing those minute details does make it a little bit more difficult for the uh, playing rules committee to understand what your rationale is, what you're trying to do ultimately within that rule. So that's certainly something to keep in mind. Um, moving on, uh, since we still got a little bit of time left, I thought we'd maybe uh, share, because uh, certainly with Matt and Bill, uh, you guys have served on the playing rules committee for quite a while, and John, you served, certainly served long enough as well. Uh, I thought we'd discuss maybe a couple of the rule change proposals that were submitted that maybe didn't quite make it too far within the uh, review process within the playing rules committee. We've certainly had a few interesting ones uh, land on Matt's desk and uh, any ones, uh, any, anything of note come to mind? Uh, yeah, let me go first, Matt. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, it was a while ago. There was a pro rule proposal that, wanted us to allow a goalie to have one free shot back at the guy who ran through him in the goal crease. Um, that's a little bit inane, but it was submitted. Um, the, uh, Were the linesmen required to hold him during that time when he got his free <laughs> shot in or <laughs> how did that? Yeah, yeah, when well, you hold him while I, while I get my free shot in, so. Did I get that right, Matt? Was that correct? Yeah, that that was uh, that was pretty much it. Yes. <laughs> so that's uh, there. I know there are others, but that's the one that I just I always remember. So, anything else come to mind, Matt? John? John, you go first, so I don't want to steal yours. Well, I, I, I think uh, we had a proposal. I think it was for a, the, the the play hockey with a pink puck. And we weren't too sure if, what the proposal was, but it was, I think it was pink. It was, it was some strange color that, that uh, they wanted to change the puck color to that. And it's like, it just takes, to me, I appreciate it. Cause I think I was the first year I was on a committee as, as, a, as a review. And it's like, we take every proposal, review it, evaluate it, discuss it. And, and bring it up. And, and that, to me, just that one still sticks back in my mind just because um, I think it was just it was kind of absurd that you would change the color of the puck, but um, from the standpoint of, of the rules go. But Matt? Yeah, I think my favorite all time is the two point line. Um, we actually had a proposal, uh, this might have been about. Uh, I think about 12 years ago, somewhere in that neighborhood, uh, at least it was, it was probably about four or five cycles ago, we had a proposal from someone who suggested that uh, similar to the NBA or the basketball, the three-point shot, uh, we should put a semicircle or a circle that uh, connects the uh, goal line uh, at about uh, the edge of the face-off circle and go all around to the top of the circles and then all the way to connect to the goal line on the other side. And any goal that was scored from outside of that line, whether it be from behind the net, whether it be from outside the zone or inside the zone from outside that line would be worth two points or two goals instead of just one. And the, the, the really good thing about it was the rationale was that if a team is down six to nothing or seven to nothing or something like that late in the game, that they would have a better opportunity to maybe catch up and be able to uh, uh, get back into the game uh, than, uh, than if uh, it, with a single goal. And, and I think, you know, what might have been a little bit flawed uh, in that rationale is there was probably a pretty good reason as to why that team was down six, seven, nothing in the first place. And uh, uh, regardless of how many points we gave them for a shot, 
uh, the chances of them probably getting back and, and uh, getting back into that game were probably pretty slim. Thanks, Matt. Uh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't share one of my own. Uh, while I don't serve on the USA Hockey Playing Rules Committee, I'm certainly sitting uh, back in the cheap seats as the meetings are going on. And uh, I usually watch the uh, keep, uh, keep tabs on the uh, rule change proposals as they come rolling in. Um, I know we had one, I believe it was, uh, I think it was eight years ago. So two rule change cycles ago, someone actually submitted a rule that at the adult level, that if a goaltender doesn't show up for an adult league team, they could officially use a shooter tutor in lieu of the missing goaltender during the games. Now the reality of it is the majority of adult leagues across the country, they're doing that anyways. They're putting that shooter tutor in because both teams agree to do it. We don't necessarily need a uh, shoot a specific rule in the rule book, allowing them to do that kind of goes down to common sense. What, you know, what makes sense here uh, as, as we move forward, but keeping in mind, you know, Submitting a rule change proposal, sometimes some rules affect other rules, which when I read that rule change for the very, very first time, that proposal, the first question that came to my mind was, well, first and foremost, how do you roster a shooter tutor on the, uh, the score sheet? But secondly, how do you substitute a shooter tutor for an extra attacker during the game? Is that you have that right once a penalty, delayed penalty actually gets called, or let's say you're losing by that one goal and you don't have the two point line to uh, score two goals to get yourself back in the game. You want to get that extra attacker out there. How do you substitute for the shooter tutor? So uh, Matt and I having clearly too much time on a Friday afternoon, and it might've been a light day at the office. We decided that ultimately a, a player from that team would have to skate all the way back to their goal, remove that shooter tutor from the goal, carry it to the bench, where he'd have to be at the bench and out of the way of play. So normal substitution rules apply for the shooter tutor before that extra attacker can actually come out there on the ice and uh, participate out there in the game. But again, keeping in mind when you submit these rule change proposals, um, some rules affect other rules and you have to kind of take that into consideration when you uh, submit your uh, proposals. On that note, we are coming up to the top of the hour, and I believe we're entering the fifth overtime. So uh, we certainly uh, maybe want to wrap this sucker up and uh, get back to uh, the NHL contest that's going on right now. So I'll uh, wrap things up here, share my screen very quickly, and share the upcoming schedule with everyone. Um, as you can see, we are in episode eight right now with USA Hockey Playing Rules coming up next week, next Tuesday, same Zoom time, same Zoom channel on August 18th is the Declaration of Player Safety. Uh, Scott Zell going to be in the captain's chair for, uh, to moderate that one, and he will be joined by Keith Barrett, who is the chairman of the USA Hockey Youth Council, the, the governing body for all youth hockey within USA Hockey. And uh, he will also, be, they, uh, will also be joined by Kenny Rausch, who is the director of youth hockey within uh, USA Hockey. So he's a national staff member, works here in the office with Matt and myself uh, as the director of youth hockey. And then lastly, uh, Matt Leaf, the director of the USA Hockey Officiating Education Program. They're going to discuss the uh, declaration of safety within USA Hockey and how far we've come through last year. Uh, since the declaration was officially launched and where we hope to see the game go as we uh, continue on uh, through this season and seasons to come. After that, we will have our diversity and inclusion episode. And uh, without a doubt, USA Hockey is very, very proud with how our overall membership has grown in both numbers and uh, diversity as well. Uh, but with, of course, growth uh, and expansion with uh, our participants in the game, there is that challenge of making sure that everyone feels accommodated and welcome to participate in our game. And that's where uh, our panelists, uh, as well as our moderator, will discuss how we can foster that culture, that positive culture where everyone feels included and welcome into our sport. And then getting into September, uh, the referee positioning, uh, where we'll talk specifically about nuts and bolts, referee positioning during the course of the game. And that'll be directed specifically towards the uh, three, officiating, three officiating system, as well as the uh, four official system. Last week, we had our two official system uh, episode, which uh, went off with great success. But now we're actually going to go down the road of discussing the three official system and four official system. So those are the upcoming episodes. I encourage you all to uh, either log in on Zoom and participate uh, within the participant uh, room of Zoom or watch us uh, on YouTube. And always remember that you can watch us uh, on demand. All episodes are recorded. And uh, once they go through the post-production, they're posted on the USA Hockey Zoom cast channel or uh, page at usahockey.com to watch on your own schedule at any given time. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media. We have a Twitter channel as well as an Instagram channel that are easy to search, easy to like, and easy to participate on. And feel free to find us and uh, look for updates within the USA Hockey Officiating Program within those channels. 
for those who are participating on Zoom, we also will have a survey that will automatically launch once this thing wraps up. Uh, please uh, feel free to share your comments and feedback within that survey. That is your one opportunity to uh, be a voice and give us that feedback. And we always look forward to your comments, uh, be it positive or even constructive. We're always looking for great ways to make the Zoomcast program uh, better for all of our members and serve our membership better. With that note, thank you to everyone who uh, participated on the Zoomcast. If it's your first time, welcome. We hope you enjoyed it. If you've been coming back, um, like Butch Martin up there in Lake Placid. I think he's been on every single episode that we've done so far. So thank you, Butch. Thank you for being a, a dedicated supporter and viewer for every single episode that we've done. Thank you for our panelists, John Karolczyk, Matt Leaf, and Bill Hall. Thank you for taking time out of your personal schedules and uh, your commitment to uh, giving back and making this program a success. And uh, with that note, everybody stay safe. Best wishes for a safe and successful season. And thank you for your dedication to USA Hockey. Thank you. Good night. Yeah.